as we get started with this, I wanted to say a few words, and I had been thinking about how I was really, really, really all set to talk about ornamental hermits tonight. Um, <laughs> It's an amazing, amazing set of circumstances that led wealthy landowners in Europe to add living humans to their landscaping as sort of full-time moving garden gnomes. But then as I started thinking about it, I realized there's a problem. And the problem is that while undeniably awesome, to be an ornamental hermit was a job. So perhaps, in fact, they are conforming to the expectations of society, society specifically in the form of people of wealth and privilege and power and the kind of social status that allows them to terraform the countryside and hire humans as decorations. And perhaps when they're not working in their, their hermit attire, shambling around gardens and weaving twigs into their beard, and being picturesquely grubby in general, perhaps on weekends, they shake off the pelts, put on a snappy suit, and head to the club for a little bit of light conversation and socializing. I mean, I don't know, but it was a job. So instead, I'm going to start with some hobby horses. This one, specifically. This was the first piece of art that made me angry. I remember specifically the moment of stepping into the gallery space it was in, looking at it and saying immediately in a impolite voice level, you have got to be fucking kidding me. <laughs> but what I didn't really realize at the time is that this is basically a totally reasonable response and that Duchamp would have approved of that response to this work. Which brings me to the hobby horse, the original hobby horse. It allegedly, allegedly taking its name from the French word for hobby horse, um, selected at random from a dictionary, the Dada movement kicked off in the early years of World War I. It was an artistic and social reaction to the horrors of war, and also something of a drinking and troublemaking club. In 1916, right? Um, a bunch of weirdos got together at the back of a bar in Zurich, Switzerland, and changed the art world forever. In July of that year, dressed in what appears to be some sassy lobster claws and several sheets of untrimmed cardboard, uh, Hugo Ball read aloud the Dada Manifesto, which is every bit as weird and underwhelming as you might hope it would be. <laughs> it's vague and kind of rambly, and it has some made-up words in it, but their absurdist aesthetic caught on and spread into the surrealist and situationist movements that came afterwards, influencing the avant-garde in art, fashion, theater, and really strange dinner parties to the present day. Salvador Dali is perhaps the most famous eccentric of the surrealist movement, and he was actually kicked out of the movement for being too commercial. <laughs> Regardless, Dali is the poster boy for eccentricity. If we, when we think of eccentrics, this is one of the photos that first comes up when you start searching for it. It was one of the most commonly suggested uh, personalities when we started brainstorming for this theme. And there is some question, like in the case of ornamental hermits, about how much of what we think of Dolly as an eccentric and his nature was as much about showmanship and the business of art as it was about his true nature. But there can be no doubt that the basic definitions of eccentric eccentricity, he certainly qualifies. And since his heyday, there has been some research conducted about the personalities and psychology that is the eccentric. The line, the line between ocelot ownership and madness. <laughs> and since no one really wants to look at statistics and bullet points, I've decided that instead, I'm just going to continue using images of Dolly's ocelot, Babu, biting people. So <laughs> he's so good. In 1995, uh, Dr. David Weeks published the results of his study of over 700 contemporary eccentric people, either self-identified or identified by friends and colleagues as eccentrics. Some of the findings are not surprising. Eccentric personalities are abundant in the arts and sciences. The stereotype of the mad scientist is there for a reason. And fields where creative thinking and problem solving are paramount. Eccentrics tend to be curious, non-conforming, creative, idealistic, happily obsessed with one or more hobby horses, intelligent and opinionated, and self-aware of their differentness from childhood. 
we had a checklist at the beginning of the year when we were talking about the psychology behind curiosity and intellectual, intellectual curiosity, and it looked a lot like this. I feel like we have some overlaps going on. But um, historically, eccentrics have been associated closely with madness. The abject lunatic and the merry weirdo intertwined in some kind of uncertain dance. There's even a modern kind of journalistic hobby of looking back at the eccentrics of the past and attempting to assign a psychological disorder retroactively. But Dr. Wheats posits that there is in fact a line, and that line has to do with agency, adaptation, and the ability to successfully function within society while still disregarding what it may think of their fabulous hat or garden grotto decorated with seashells. It has also often been said that the difference between crazy and eccentric is money, but this study undermines that assumption to some degree. While it is true that having money certainly does give a certain amount of freedom to do whatever the hell one wants, that doesn't necessarily mean that a positive cash flow leads to wackiness. It is true, though, that a certain level of agency, whether born of position and privilege or of a bloody-minded willingness to bend the rules and take the consequences come that may, is required. Living the strange life is not without those consequences, so must, one must be in the position to accept them. So that brings to mind the question, this one's really good, isn't it? <laughs> um, it brings to mind the question, is eccentricity a positive adaptation to what other, other circumstances might be a full-blown disorder? If Dolly could not have been full Dolly, we know the world might be a less interesting place for it, but it seems almost certain that he, as a man, already burdened with some reasonably well-known neuroses, might have instead been a deeply unhappy and troubled man. And one can only wonder what that might have meant for his art. Which brings me back to the art. The Dada movement and the Surrealists after that were about more or possibly less than the art. Their antics, art, and experimental happenings stood against conformity in favor of experience. It was a rebellion against mass manufactured goods and commodities, against lack of critical thought. The rise of absurdism was in direct response to the futility and lack of power they felt in the face of the horrors of World War I. And they carried on through a century defined by war and the consequences thereof. Like the archetypical fool being able to speak truth to power in a way that a gentleman might never, their artwork intentionally provokes response and encourages both criticism and conversation. The movement gave both a home and inspiration to generations of eccentrics to manifest their strange visions in the company of others, stirring the pot and inspiring others to action. So fine. I get it. I might even like it in retrospect. For me, understanding the, the eccentrics behind the art is a process from going from hating the art object to admiring the weirdos behind it and feeling inspired by their example of ignoring what the proverbial Joneses might be up to and begin to ask oneself, how does one get an aardvark? <laughs> As a result of this, I've had to update some essential truths that we hold to be self-evident around here. It has long been known that jerks have made a significant impact on history. <laughs> but I'm happy to update the Venn diagram because as this evening's talks will show, eccentrics have a way of forcing themselves into the narrative, leaving behind a pleasingly outsized footprint on history themselves. As we begin this evening of stories of those who lived their own truths and defied the conventions of society, I'd like to bear in mind the power of nonconformity and the freedom it provides to provoke to incite change, to inspire others and impact the world around us. Because in that freedom lies strength to change the course of history, like those at Cabaret Voltaire in 1916. A half a century before the Dadas began their war on, on the art world, John Stuart Mill wrote about the power of nonconformity. He wrote, in this age, the mere example of nonconformity, the mere refusal to bend the knee to custom, it itself is a service precisely because the tyranny of opinion is such as to make eccentricity a reproach, it is desirable in order to break away, to break through that tyranny that people should be eccentric. Eccentricity is always abounded when and where strength of character is abounded, and the amount of eccentricity in a society has generally been proportional to the amount of genius, mental vigor, and moral courage which it contains, that so few now dare to be eccentric marks the chief danger of the time. 1859. 
slightly more cooperative Babu here. I'd like to raise the first glass of the evening in memory of the non-conforming weirdos that came before us, who we'll be hearing about tonight, to the hobby horses and to the hermits, and to Babu for not giving in to the expectations of cooperative pet status and living his full bitey cat truth, at least most of the time. To the eccentrics, everyone. Coming up tonight, we are hearing stories of bon vivants and relentless optimists, people who made the decision to live their lives unconstrained by the rules the rest of society spent so much time trying to uphold. I think you will see, like the participants in the more recent studies, that they were happier for it. And because of their strangeness and odd adaptations, they left behind larger-than-life legacies. Please join me in welcoming this evening's speakers. We have for you five Odd Salon Fellows tonight, an unusual, an unusual happening. Alexander Razo Myers, Stuart Gritman, Beth Abdallah, Isolde Honore, and Frederick Lightning Leist. And joining us for the first time, and the reason we have this beautiful piano on stage, Martin Strauss. Everyone. Yeah. 